Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Decatur at the Macon County Conservation District at their window on wildlife, really enjoying watching these birds feed right outside in the woods. Uh, these guys aren't in any danger of extinction, but many animals are. And here at the Conservation District, there's a fascinating exhibit called Saving Endangered Species, Saving Ourselves. Come on and take a look. Well, Jeff Tisch, it's symbolic that we're looking at a flashing amber light because that's caution. Very much Everybody so. knows that's caution. You are right. And here at the Macon County Conservation District, this exhibit is all about what we have and how to save it. Right? Yes, sir. That's and sometimes you get a yellow blinking signal when, when, when a species is in trouble. We do. Well, there are warning signs that people can see and notice if the research is there. And once you realize that, it's a signal that there may be something worse going to happen. So many times nature will help us that way. We pay attention to those signals that are being provided. Uh, and many times people have stepped up and made a change and uh, had some habitat protection mm -hmm. that's literally saved lives. Yeah. There's a, there are instances, uh, unfortunately, where we have lost entire species in this country, but there are a lot of success stories, too. And so during this program, we're going to tell some of the success stories, and we're going to also tell one of the very unfortunate stories about the passenger pigeon, which did not uh, right. live through the, uh, uh, the population of the United States. But let's move this way first, if we could, because okay. uh, you mentioned the Bell Museum. I, I believe they're out of Minnesota. Yes, they are, uh, James this is a, Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is now a traveling exhibit, because you all have it, have it, have it now. And, and what we see here, from, if we're looking at the year of about 1800, this includes the, uh, the River Valley, and this would be Illinois right here. And if you look at the green areas as forested areas, and the, the golden areas, as I guess the prairie areas, right, right. you can see that, um, that there was a lot of both, wasn't there, in 1800? Yeah, the Midwest carried uh, such a diverse habitat that provided both a uh, home for many, many varieties and species of plants. And obviously, if you have those, then you have the animals that inhabit those areas. Mm -hmm. And then things over time, as settlement began to occur, things began to change. Boy, and I'll tell you, on the opposite map, you can really see the contrast between what was in 1800 and what is today. It almost looks like uh, a wasteland. As you look at this map, you see a lot of white areas throughout the, the majority, and yet you'll find a few little tan patches representing prairie, uh, not a lot of forested areas except along no. the tributaries. Uh, and then some other wetland type mm -hmm. habitats. But many of those are more to the north and more to the south. It's remarkable that we have any wildlife left at all. When mm -hmm. you look at a map like this, it's alarming. Sure. If you think about someone coming into your neighborhood with a, a bulldozer or something that could uh, essentially eliminate where mm -hmm. you're living and, and your garden and your yard and your grocery store and everything that you need, uh, you'd have to pick up and move somewhere else, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And that's many times what the wildlife did. They tried to find a new place to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we're, as we go through this, we're going to show that there, uh, there is, of course, a lot of wildlife in central Illinois that's not endangered in any way. So there have been efforts to, to, to preserve, and in some cases, re uh, uh, Enter or re, re establish right. species. They, they've reintroduced uh, several species, including the otter, the river otter, mm -hmm. uh, the deer, believe it or not, that became very, very low in numbers, and the wild turkey, mm -hmm. the American mm -hmm. wild turkey that we never used to have yeah. here. And now we're being told that uh, obviously we have wild turkeys because yeah. they come to the window on wildlife. They, they we'll come take to a your look wildlife at. window. It's That's hilarious. True. And there's river otters in the river. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll see some examples of those. Um, th these, these photographs are just wonderful. We're looking at some now, uh, uh, at some of the uh, ecosystems that we did see on the map over there in 1800 when, when, it, was, when it was flourishing. But this is, I guess this is uh, just good old prairie, right? Exactly, yeah. More than half the state of Illinois was covered by prairie, and uh, that's essentially what built the soils that are so rich and so wonderful for the, the crops that are grown mm -hmm. here, critical to the, uh, 
the world food market, as we well know. Yeah. So prairies are, and yet they're beautiful to see. Oh, they are. They are. I can't imagine riding over one in a covered wagon, but my mm. goodness, a lot of people did. That would be rough. I can't imagine what yeah. those early pioneer folks went through. As and of course, the, the, the woodlands, I mean, we had uh, not so much in Illinois, but the rest of the Midwest, we had gobs and gobs and gobs of forest. Forested areas were critical for many different species. and. The only final remains many times were along the tributaries, the major mm -hmm. rivers and creeks and streams, uh, and yet some of the areas that uh, were even smaller and not suitable for either human habitation or farming, they still exist, and uh, the Macon County Conservation District was able to uh, attain many of those and yeah. protect and provide yeah. habitat. When we tell the passenger pigeon story, we're going to uh, uh, accent the fact that this was this was the habitat for the passenger pigeon, right. and hence one of the reasons why he he couldn't make it. And you have a lot of kids' things in here too. For instance, you'll if I'm a little tyke and I'm only about three feet tall, I walk in there, I open this up, and and this tells me stories about what they might find or what what they may have found in the past if they if they lived at a time when, for instance, when the when the uh, decurrent false aster was around. Kids can still see the New England aster at times of the year. That's right. They he are here at the Nature Center and many of the, the natural areas that have prairie. They've been reintroduced and the little kiosks that are around that we'll see more later of are really fun. Kids love mm -hmm. to come and engage. They like to move things around a little sure, bit sure. and read a little brief story. Uh, and hopefully we're inspiring them to say, hey, this is kind of cool to see and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. they might not use it in their life every day, but it's still good to know that they're mm -hmm. there and protected. And of course, Illinois is famous for being all oh, part of the Mississippi Flyway. And if we look at this, you look at some of the wetlands that are created by the huge rivers that run through Illinois and, and uh, what we were trying to reestablish again, because my goodness, how many, how, I don't mean how many ducks and geese we've got, especially in this part at this time in March, now, how many, uh, they, they talk about huge flocks going over. Yeah, and they're all looking for a place to They are looking for rest. a place, and it's kind of tough because so many this year, in fact, are iced over still. So mm -hmm. they are in migration. We watched uh, yesterday, I was out in the yard a lot watching the snow geese migrating over. Of course, yeah. the Canada geese are, are on the move and many of the songbirds. But wetlands yeah. are critical. They used to be numerous all over prairie potholes, they called many yeah. of those. Yeah. And uh, we've reestablished uh, some of those here on district property, and they they are definite attractions yeah. to the aquatic habitat. Yeah, it really helps. So much of Illinois was drained because it was such good farmland. Exactly. And uh, and and of course, if you're you're trying to make the most out of every acre you've got, you're going to drain it and you're going to plant cash crops, right. on it, which was done all over the state. Uh, good for the farmer, but not necessarily good for the wildlife. Right. Now the eagle is a success story, and and we can if we live either in Illinois or in our neighboring states you'll see a lot of eagles around the big waterways. You finally are beginning to see more and more and more. Back in the day, there were known to be upwards to 500,000 of these birds. They too were, were viewed as kind of a, a pest and uh, they harvested them to feed the hogs and uh, mm -hmm. eventually with the chemical uh, influx of a variety of things, especially DDT, uh, that was known to cause some uh, deprivation. The mm -hmm. shells were not thick enough. Uh, and they finally realized that uh, we were down to only about 500 breeding pairs in the lower 48. Oh, man. Yeah. So we nearly lost the American bald eagle. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, though. I mean, I, given a chance, these species will come back. Uh, the bald eagle has the advantage of not being particularly picky about what he or she eats. I mean, they'll eat almost well, anything. That is true. And, uh, and so if they get a good start, uh, for instance, like you say, if they get out of the nest, they're in pretty good shape. They can. And you have a lot of opportunities to look at eagles over here. Um, in fact, we have some local photographers who've, who've graced your walls with, uh, with their work. Howard Rowe is one of them, isn't he? Howard has been a volunteer with the Macon County Conservation District for more than 25 years. He's helped provide shows. He's helped with our audiovisual programming. He's donated just presently mm -hmm. uh, numerous photographs for a volunteer recognition dinner. Mm -hmm. Great, great guy to have on the team of volunteers. Right down here is, a, is an interesting thing. You talk about what the kids like to do. They, they can touch and, and, uh, and open things here. This is the story about uh, how the, the bald eagle became the national symbol. Uh, but if we look straight up, we can see that there was an alternative at one time, That's wasn't right. there? That's right. Benjamin Franklin, he yeah. was fighting for the wild turkey. He really <laughs> wanted it bad.
<laughs> but we're kind of glad that the uh, bald eagle ended up winning out. It is a beautiful bird, a beautiful success story. Yeah, that's that no turkey is, is a pretty, pretty impressive uh, symbol, it is. though. It's, it's big, I'll tell you. Yep. And we're looking at some more of your local photographers' works. Yes. Not only Howard, but you had some other photographers involved, too. We do. You? Howard Rowe has taken all the images you just saw. And we also had a couple of other photographers that include Jerry Seavers mm -hmm. and also David Staff. Mm -hmm. uh, our photographers on the volunteer team are incredible. And we have upwards to 250 to 300 volunteers that help us do exactly. a variety of things. Uh, yeah. Habitat restoration and leading nature hikes and checking the trails and, of course, yeah. donating photographs. The district wouldn't be... Any, anywhere near what it is without your volunteers. It's work. true. I think they play a key role in the entire United States with what they yeah. do. Volunteers do so many things for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's turn around and look at some of these other at some of these other eagle images here. We mentioned that they, this one's on ice, I believe, uh, but they, they certainly like to be near near the big waterways where where they've got the fish uh, as a source of food. They sure do. That's a main source, and that's why they'll head south in the winter. You see them in the lock and dam areas. They, they'll they move along where they can find open water, mm -hmm. but they're not hesitant to feed on other things, as you mentioned earlier. They will feed on a, a dead deer. Uh, when the bison uh, population was depleted during the 1800s, uh, eagles moved on and populations mm -hmm. decreased because they would feed on some of those that were dead mm -hmm. in the areas. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of an opportunist, but yet so sharp and wonderful to look and see that adult with the bright white head, oh, white they tail. Are. They are, and the size is just so impressive. Um, down below Quincy, they've got a lock and dam at Quincy, and down below there, this time of year, you may, you, in a day, you may find 100 or 200 of them. Yes. Uh, and they seem to work well together. I mean, they don't mm -hmm. seem to get in each other's way. Not a lot. I have watched them catch a fish before, and another one will dive in out of somewhere, fly in, I should say, and, mm -hmm. and try to steal that fish yeah. from them. And we have them around here. People <laughs> spot them along Lake Decatur. I've seen them along the uh, Sangamon River in mm -hmm. the winter because the water's still open. Yeah. And uh, just a beautiful species to yeah. have on board. We, we, uh, we not only have those, but we have other non-endangered species, which you have highlighted here as well. And those are here lar largely as a result of efforts taken in the past to make sure that their habitat remained intact. Exactly. And uh, let's go that way. Okay? Sure. Take a look. Well, Jeff, we presently don't have to worry about these guys, right? That's right. They're all A-OK. -okay. That's, that's the kingfisher. You, if, you, if you were to go down the Sangamon River on a canoe, you'd probably see him a few times crossing in front of you. You would. They're big. They're huge. They dive right into the water. The belted kingfisher is pretty common. And here at the mm -hmm. ponds, we'll see them here at the Nature Center, too. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he might run into a coyote or see a coyote on the bank of the river while he's, uh, while he's flying over. Right. Coyotes are probably more numerous than they could be, should be. Mm -hmm. There's not really much of a predator for yeah. the coyotes. The white-winged scoter is the duck you've got there. And then behind him, I love the great horned owl. Great that's horned wonderful. owls. Everybody loves seeing owls. Uh, maybe that's because of the Harry Potter stories that many people <laughs> have read. But they are interesting to see. And oh, they're, and they're, they're beautiful. Still, they are. And they're so big. And when you see one, it's kind of rare because they tend to be, you know, you see them at night, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but when you see one, it's always a, it's oh, always yes. a surprise. They're, they're huge in size yeah. with almost, you know, two and a half, three foot wingspan or more. Yeah. But huge. We talked about some success stories. Uh, yeah, there are some species in trouble. And yeah, some have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. But man has handled some things pretty well, too. Mm -hmm. And we've got a case here that shows that. On the top is the river otter. And you mentioned him earlier. It's incredible to see what's happened to the otter with uh, back in the day. It was down to very few numbers, a population fewer than 100. And they were reintroduced, and we are being told uh, currently that they're being spotted here in the river, the Sangamon River, at the Rock Springs Nature Center. In fact, they just uh, implemented a, a trapping season uh, this last year, 2012-13. Oh, that's 2012, terrific. 13, so. That's really good news. Um, and then below it, of course, we saw the wild turkey specimen. You've got the feathers there laid out. The, the wild turkey, it was gone from Illinois, wasn't it? It, it was not around much at all, and they reintroduced those. Uh, they come to the feeding station now and bring their family, so That's it's, nice. it's fun. Good place to come and see them if you've never laid eyes on a wild yeah. turkey. And this little fawn, now we're, we're not in any trouble with white-tailed deer in Illinois now, but uh, before 1950, they were rare, mm -hmm. weren't they? Not many seen, and there's way more now uh, that are here than when the pioneers uh, were here. And uh, perfect habitat for them. They find what they need. A lot of corn mm -hmm. and beans provide a food source, and they're uh, a good species for the the deer hunting population, the, the people. Yeah. To I'll bet you see active. them come to the uh, to the nature window too, mm -hmm. don't you? They do. They'll bring up their 
babies, the fawns with the mothers, and uh, yeah. we'll see three or four fussing with each other. <laughs> they have a great time. They'll kick the squirrels out of the way, literally. They'll take their front feet and launch a squirrel. And uh, Graham, not, well, I don't no, want the squirrel to get squirrels hurt. Squirrels get no respect. No, for that. but it's it's rather funny to watch. <laughs> that's for sure. They don't deserve respect. <laughs> they, they steal birds' feet. And we've got uh, the, the, what is this? Is this the, the, the eastern bluebird that eastern we're looking at? Eastern bluebirds in the same family as the robin. Uh, they used to be as numerous as robins, but the starling came into play and mm -hmm. took over a lot of their nesting sites. And once again, as you said earlier, Mark, people stepped up. They built houses uh, to provide habitat. We have several trails here at the Nature Center. In fact, this last year, the bluebirds fledged 111 baby bluebirds. The tree swallows also get into those nest boxes and mm -hmm. use them, mm -hmm. and the house wrens, so, and that's okay. Yeah. But they are beautiful. A completely different kind of a blue, not a blue jay, mm -hmm. but an eastern bluebird is just mm -hmm. beautiful to see. And the males have the big bright Do they chest, stay year so. round or do they migrate? They'll move along, but sometimes we get reports of them here in the winter. If they mm -hmm. find a, a habitat with berries, uh, they will go ahead and stay in that area. And we've got them back here already. Mm -hmm. They came back in February. So if people at home, are, they're in an area where there's forest and open area, if they build bluebird nests, are they likely to get them? It's a little bit of a trick. You might, uh, the bluebird hole is the same size and big enough for sparrows to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you have to be brave and strong if you're really going to try to manage for the bluebirds and clean that out if they come. And theoretically, if you keep trying, you may get lucky. Probably mm -hmm. not in the city, but as you said, if you're out near an edge where you've got open territory, mm -hmm. you just might have success. You won't know till you try. Yeah, yeah. Dr. David Horn, among all these endangered species, we have one here that's unfortunately much more than endangered, been gone a long time. That's the passenger pigeon. And the stories are from the late 1800s that there were times when there were so many passenger pigeons in the central U.S. that they would blacken the sky when flocks of them would fly over. And now they're all gone. It is hard to imagine that the most abundant land bird in North America, the passenger pigeon, was considered super abundant in the Midwest as late as the early 1870s. Mm -hmm. And by 1901, the last wild passenger pigeon was extirpated from Illinois. And the last one died in captivity in 1914. Now, which brings us to a very interesting specimen because you at Mil your department at Millican is in possession of the last known passenger pigeon in, in Illinois? It, not only in Illinois, this is the last passenger pigeon killed in the wild for which we still have a record of its mm -hmm. death. And it was killed in 1901 near Oakford, Illinois. Mm -hmm. After its death, it was um, given to a taxidermist who prepared it. And that taxidermist, his name was Oliver Biggs, and he was from San Jose, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And we have an article about him over here, him and his family. But he was uh, a fellow named Atterbury, killed this bird, or at least brought this bird to him. And uh, he preserved it. Um, and then somehow he, became, he came into possession of it again and his family held on to it. So what's so interesting about this particular uh, bird's death is that there were individuals that had the foresight to say this is an animal that is uh, quite historic and there needs to be a very important record of it made. Mm -hmm. And so not only did Biggs prepare the bird, but he then later reacquired it from Atterbury, understanding its important mm -hmm. significance. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, Biggs and his daughter, Hazel, they opened up a museum in San Jose with many of Biggs's uh, prepared specimens, and Hazel also did some taxidermy as well. Mm -hmm. But Olive also received some of her father's collection Olive, it turns out, was a Millican University graduate from 1926. And upon her father's passing, presumably in 1947, Olive donated to Millican University 200 specimens, 
including this specimen, Big Blue. Big Blue. Let's look at Big Blue again because this tells a little bit of a story about the life cycle of these birds. He's sitting, I believe he's sitting on an oak branch yep. because I see, I see the, uh, the acorn right above his head. They needed these oak forests and these acorns, didn't they? Yes, passenger pigeons um, were considered nomadic and they would form very large flocks to first find uh, particular food sources and also form flocks to find appropriate nesting sites. The flocks of passenger pigeons were estimated to be one billion in size. Mm, wow. To put that number in perspective, if you were to see the sandhill crane migration, in the Platte River of Nebraska, mm -hmm. you would be seeing 500,000 birds over a six week period. The flight of passenger pigeons was 2,000 times that number of birds. And it was thought that these birds would blacken the skies mm -hmm. when they flew. And these migrations might take a day or two for all the birds wow. to move through. Uh, in addition, they formed very large nesting colonies. The largest nesting colony was in Wisconsin. It was about 1,400 square miles. Oh my goodness. And it was thought that there would be hundreds of thousands of nesting pairs. Mm -hmm. let's, let's walk over here, David, because there's a little exhibit over here which talks about, about the death of the species. Um, it, it's almost incomprehensible that billions like that in the Midwest could be gone. But one of the weaknesses or one of the characteristics of the passenger pigeon was that they, they nested in these immense colonies. And once you disrupted that colony, they weren't very successful at reproducing, were they? Yes. The extinction of the passenger pigeon was a result of a, a number of, of things that were occurring simultaneously. First, there was a large number of people that hunted them. And so when you had these massive flocks flying overhead, individuals could simply shoot upwards and they were bound to hit mm -hmm. a large number of, of pigeons. But that's not what's thought to have been the driver of the extinction. The driver of the extinction was a result of those hunters going into those locations where they were nesting. Mm -hmm. They were disrupting the nesting colonies. The birds would fly away. Add to that a couple of technological innovations in the form of railroad access. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly individuals could get to the nesting colonies quickly. They could uh, kill as many birds as they could ship them on rail cars, the birds would disperse to other areas, mm -hmm. not be able to successfully nest. Yeah. The final thing that was happening is as people were moving from east to west, we were altering the habitat. And so the two major food sources of the birds, beech nuts and acorns, those trees were being cut down as westward expansion was occurring. Mm -hmm. And so there was also habitat loss of the birds yeah. as well. Well, doctor, thank you. And what a, uh, what a wonderful uh, uh, specimen for Millican to have, Big Blue, the last, the last passenger pigeon. It's a, it's a specimen that we treasure. Uh, however, I'm not sure a day goes by when we don't wonder about what it would be like if we still had the passenger pigeon yeah. and those billions of birds flying yeah. through. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jeff, I'm assuming that a lot of in Illinois, central Illinois, looked like this at one time. I think they're calling this a savanna ecosystem. Those were habitats that could be found out many times in the middle of uh, prairie areas, places mm -hmm. that had a variety of trees, especially the bur oak was a, a popular species. It could survive the prairie fires that moved through. Yeah. And you still have some prairie species down uh, underneath in the understory of yeah. those areas. Yeah. Restoring that would be beneficial for, for lots of different kinds of habitat. Uh, I mean, the birds are obviously would love the bur oaks, and the bur oaks are huge, aren't they? They're massive. They come right up there. They look like they're hairy on the branches. They have so many tiny little branches mm -hmm. all over them, and uh, 
a beautiful large acorns that makes a good mass crop for wildlife. And as you say, the trees combination, uh, that with the prairie, you've got blend of both habitats, and so you have a good diversity of, of species, both plants and animals that love those savannas. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this would, be, this would be a really good thing to be able to restore if, if we could. And there are a lot of places in Illinois that are attempting to do that. They do. Yeah. We are one of those. We have a restoration team that documents where these already exist and if they need help uh, in order to reestablish them. Uh, and I don't know how many we have presently, but they are doing yeah. good work to, to provide protection yeah. for those. You mentioned the bur oak was, was, uh, w worked because it could survive the prairie fires. And a lot of what conservationists do now is intentionally burn back some of these areas because wildfire was, was normal. It was, a, it was a productive thing in the prairie, wasn't it? Very much so. The fires that burned actually helped preserve those prairies because they did kill off many of the other trees that would have shaded out the mm -hmm. prairies and then they cannot grow. So we use that as a tool. We have a team of uh, prairie burning staff that uh, come in and also volunteers that do burns works great yeah. and, and you'd be amazed at how quickly that prairie comes right back. The roots are 15, 20 feet deep so there's no harm done mm -hmm. to the plants at mm -hmm. all. Um, and, and you mentioned that your district has about 200 volunteers. There are volunteer opportunities all over central Illinois with a number of conservation groups for people to become stewards. Sure. If, if people are interested in being active like that uh, with the Conservation District or the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission, the DNR, uh, there's a variety of opportunities and it's critical for people to step up and volunteer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. It's been a pleasure. It's yeah. been so much fun. I hope people take the opportunity to come and take a look. Well, we'll just remind them one more time, saving endangered species Saving Ourselves is here at the Macon County Conservation District, and it's only up until the end of March. So you might want to get out here sooner than later to see it. With another Illinois Story Indicator, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.